Hi, Martin, and hi, everybody. Can we start the talk now? Yes, please start. Okay. Okay, so hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Shivashish, and today we're talking about end-to-end -end processing of satellite imagery data with Python. Uh, a little bit about me. Thanks, Martin, for the introduction, by the way. That was spot on. I'll just skip the part which Martin said. Apart from that, I love Earth observation, and I built Feliset. We'll talk about it briefly later, and this is what the talk is based upon. And I, in my day job, I work at Groofers, and uh, I, I, I was a GSOC student in 2019 with the Mission Support System, and I like maps, plants, Etc. and lastly, postal services. So, okay, so before we start the talk, uh, let's go through a challenge. Like, uh, if you follow ESA's Earth Observation channel on Twitter, they host a challenge every, every week and it says where or not, and they give you an image of a random place on Earth. You have to guess where it is, right? So, your 10 second timer starts now. And yeah, I scroll for a bit. Okay, I hope you have your answer, but this is the state of Gibraltar. The part above is Spain and the part below is Morocco, right? So, okay, that's the fun part. The rest of the part is boring. I hope not, but yeah, I'll try to make it interesting. Um, so the outline of the talk would be like this. We'll go through a brief overview of how uh, Earth observation techniques are practiced. And then we'll review some tools which we can use with Python to process Earth observation data. And then uh, we will go through satellite data formats, how are they captured, how are they stored, and we'll try to build or, uh, you know, uh, we'll try to generate a scheme in which we can fit a satellite imagery data pipeline. And then we'll do a code review of Feliset. So Feliset is a tool which uh, lets you download and uh, process satellite imagery data from the command line. And we'll go through the code. This will also help you to build your own pipelines as well, right? And later on, we'll talk about some other cool projects which people have done in this area. And we'll conclude the talk. So uh, what constitutes Earth observation? EO is the gathering of information about the attributes of the planet Earth. And then uh, it encompasses both space-based remotely sensed data as well as ground-based observation, right? So for example, we have a, a drone which captures data related to agriculture or the mining fields, et cetera. That is also Earth observation. Then we have a seismograph, which uh, which captures the uh, basically you know the disturbances in the Earth's crust, right? And the thirdly, there is satellite imagery, right? This is this is what we'll be talk, talking about in a more detailed manner. But all of these are examples of Earth observation. Let's now talk about the types of data which is collected. So first is 2D data, right? You have a map, or let's not talk. Uh, okay, you have a sheet of land, and then you take a picture of it from above and uh, you map it, right? That is a 2D data. You have a coordinate called latitude and you have a dimension called longitude, right? So that's terrestrial mapping. And then you can uh, survey and map ocean floors for uh, different biological, uh, basically algae deposition, let's say. So stuff like that, they can be 2D mapping. About 3D, let's say you are taking into consideration the amount or density of SO2 in an atmosphere. So you have latitude, longitude, and then you have uh, depth to the data, right? Or the altitude. So that is atmospheric data. And then if you model marine systems, like how waves flow, how, uh, how the temperature varies, considering the depth of the ocean, et cetera. So all of these are 3D data. And then if you have time series of 2D data, for example, you are mapping how a place or the topography of a place, it has changed over the years. So it has a time component to it. So that's 3D data. And then you have point cloud data, right? So a point as in you have LIDAR and you map an object or a building with LIDAR, you have a, a point cloud of every point, and then you have the X, Y, and Z component to it. So that's 3D. And in 4D, let's say you have a time series of uh, some SO2 concentration data set. So that's 4D, right? And then you can, have, you can have multiple dimensions to it. So these are some categories of data which is collected. Let's answer a few questions first. So why should I do this? Or why should anyone uh, try to even practice Earth observation? Uh, right to help the subject matter expert uh, like for example me i don't know a lot of stuff about the science or the science related to earth observation but i can help people who are doing this right i can give back to them uh, if they need any help i can just be of help because i practice computer science so and why python python because it's very widely adopted and there are 
a lot of rich and well maintained libraries in python related to geospatial and uh, earth observation and you can get a lot of support right lastly let's talk about uh, some libraries which we can use right the infrastructure which is already built so there is rasterio rasterio is a library which is developed by mapbox and it can be used to um, uh, deal with raster data sets we'll talk about what raster and data uh, vector data are later but i think most of people already know so gdal is a library which is like the king of geospatial i mean everybody has uh, use gdal at one point of the time at least so uh, it has some python bindings which we can use to interact with geospatial data and lastly cartopy so cartopy is the uh, library which helps us create maps from the data so we have some data we want to plot it in a map we use cartopy to do this okay so that's about the data which are stored uh, let's talk about how they are captured right so we have uh, two kinds of sensor in general so first one is passive sensors for example the sunlight it when it uh, basically hits earth and then every object reflects some amount of light to back to the space right so the satellite captures these reflected data sets and it records it and then tries to generate various data on top of it right and then we have active sensors for example sar data or surf synthetic aperture radar data so they hit earth with a particular ray and then they calculate the reflectance of uh, every object from those rays which they only hit so this is active sensors we mainly talk about passive sensors because they are more abundantly available these data let's not talk about bands so like i told you a uh, plain white light is reflected from earth right and we know that a spectrum consists of a lot of uh, uh, wavelengths right so for every wavelength the band records uh, a band is specifically for one set of wavelength if you can see here from uh, we have various kinds of bands for example the one would be ultraviolet and then we have blue then three green four red and same then there is nir then swir then there is thermal infrared so all of these wavelengths are captured in a particular band in the satellite data right let's not talk about resolution so uh, if you can just look into the two images here first one is from sentinel 2 service the second one is from uh, pleiades so the first one has a resolution of 10 meter and the second one has a resolution of 50 cm so resolution tells us what one pixel in the image represents the length of the same object on earth on on a surface right so if the resolution is smaller the image is generally better right if you can see here so the left one is kind of blurry compared to the second one right and also since we capture different wavelengths in uh, different sensors so the resolution can be different we'll see examples of how bands are structured in landsat and sentinel and for someone who doesn't know landsat and sentinel are one of the two major satellite services which open source their data right so yeah so before we talk about that let's talk a bit about the types of data formats right so we have raster and vector data so we've talked about raster io which interacts with raster data vector data if you have uh, seen geojson or shapely uh, sorry shape files then these are kinds of vector data right they just store the edge or the corners or the boundary of the data involved right and some properties respected to the boundary they are not graded unlike raster so bands are uh, yeah okay so bands are stored as geotiff on net area because we have every grid reflecting some data and this is a good example of raster data right so we store them in raster data formats so they are mainly geotiff and net cdf right if it is 2d then geotiff is really handy and if the number of dimensions are really huge then we go for net cdf for efficiency again after that we uh, store the metadata of the satellite imagery for example what was the angle of inclination when a satellite took a photograph or recorded some data right and uh, what date did it capture it on etc uh, now uh, yeah like i told you 2d arrays are stored in one band which is generally in geo tiff format some general bands are blue green red uh, a range of infrared like we saw in landsat and then there is a panchromatic band panchromatic band is used to enhance the resolution but we'll talk about it in a bit more detail fashion later on okay so i told you how uh, we'll talk about what are the kinds of bands available in uh, landsat and sentinel so first is landsat we have blue green red and some coastal aerosol and then we have some kinds of infrared uh, wavelengths 
then we have the panchromatic wavelength sorry it's not a wavelength uh, mm -hmm. but yeah basically it helps us to enhance the rgb image or the resolution of any kind of image we generate from the satellite imagery data right and then we have some thermal infrared band sentinel 2 i mean most of this uh, basically the only thing that changes are the nomenclature and most of this the there are a lot of common stuff between these two services and we can find rgb we can find uh, um, infrared and ultraviolet like coastal aerosol so one more thing which changes between these two services are the resolution right so landsat has a smaller resolution than sentinel which is about 10 meters for rgb band right that's why the sentinel images are more clear than the, than landsat okay so we talked about how satellite data is captured and stored let's talk about how we can use the exist, existing satellite imagery data to build our own satellite imagery data pipeline so th this is an example of a generic data pipeline so the first step is etl right extraction transformation and luring so you search some sources of data you fetch and aggregate this data to a common place so that you don't have to go through this process again and again when you when any new kind of data comes on right and then uh, you process on this data right so for example you are training a model right so to store the uh, to load the stored data in runtime and apply data processing technique we go through uh, the second step right so the goal of the second step is to make the third step which is generic generate insight stays easier for example you don't want to train the model in runtime so you train it beforehand which is the second step the third step for example when a new satellite image comes in you want to uh, segregate the buildings there and draw diagrams over it this step should be really fast because because your end users are expecting it to be fast they don't want to wait uh, for a long long time so that's why the third step should be really fast that's how we have to design the pipeline right so let's not talk about this pipeline in a better context or in the context of a satellite imagery data so first is searching data right so we have something called stack which is a spatial temporal asset catalog this this is a spec an api spec so basically uh, every stack catalog has catalog of some satellite imagery data sets it's not necessarily satellite imagery data set but that's what it's primarily handling nowadays and then we can uh, do a simple http apis to filter and query the satellite data for example think of some common query parameters which you can give to a satellite imagery catalog right so we can uh, query on the date where the image was taken we can query on the cloud cover right and then we can query on some other stuff as in what was this type of service for example landsat or sentinel etc so development seed has hosted a stack catalog and we can query it to kind of get so this is the first step when you query a stack catalog right to uh, get what kind of so for example in here we got uh, that the this catalog at and sentinel data sorry yeah so we have these two kind of satellite imagery hosted in the stack service right so after after you search it, you then get a list of URLs to download your images from. So you give the uh, stack catalog some parameters to query on, for example, your cloud cover and sort it in a descending order. Then you get a list of imagery products, right? Basically some captures, some images, if you can put it that way. So here I have a list of 15 images and you can go through these URLs later. I'll share the slide on Discord channel. And then every image or every product has some certain images then they give you links to the bands right this is if i can let me try to yeah i just try to zoom in I zoom in then i get some links to some bands involved like i told you every satellite imagery data has some bands like b1 to b14 every band represents a wavelength so you can download or rather this stack catalog links us to download all of these uh, data sets and then we can take each of these links and download them and process them later right let's go back to the slides and Right, so we downloaded all the data. We downloaded a band three, oh, sorry, two, three, and four, which is RGB. Right. Let's set this as a context, as in every time we'll talk about downloading and processing something, let's talk about RGB data. It, it is very easy. So since uh, Stack APIs already have done a great job in to organize the data, we don't have to bother a lot about what kind of um, do we have to do, do some extra processing on top of it. No, they just take. They just try to make it more generic right so we download the data we download the bands and then we try to do some uh, you know like cost cutting for example if you have uh, the data of so2 concentration over 
Argentina over a long period of time, say 1970 to 2010, and you don't want all of those data. So you strip the data to fit into a more recent, like 2015 to 2020. It saves you a lot of costs, right? And you have to remove unnecessary bands. For example, the free uh, open source version of Sentinel 2A, uh, which is hosted by EOS, I think. So they give you a zip file with all of the bands. You don't need all of the bands. So you just try to remove the unnecessary bands, right? And you can change the storage formats. You get in GeoTIFF format, you can change and store them at a location of your choice, right? And these images will be used next when, while you're trying to process the band, right? So the result of our ETL should be an efficient file server, right? And your all of the data stored should be really efficient. When I query something, you should get really fast. And then only required data in the form of GeoTIFFs or NetSeria for any other data format, provided it will be really efficient. That's the goal of this step. Right, so in data processing, what we do is we try to, um, sorry about that. Yeah, so uh, uh, we try to, generate meaningful images out of it, right? Out of the bands we created. So we have RGB bands, then we have uh, NIR, NIR band. We can, we can basically make it to uh, make, you know, an NIR, we can basically convert the NIR band to find vegetation data more clearly, right? And then if, if we have some uh, ML models hosted, then we can process our images or train the ML models in this step, right? And uh, we have something called RoboChat, which is already like basically a model developed by Mapbox. It helps you segment data like roads and um, uh, buildings, etc. So you can go through all of the these model training in this step. And this is not the step where user is querying for the data. This is the step after ETL. And we are trying to uh, modify the images or data which we stored to make it more usable in the last step. Right? We can do panchromatic enhancement. So what I mean by panchromatic enhancement, if you see the Landsat spec, then uh, panchromatic band has a resolution of 15 meter, right? So it is basically a grayscale image with a better resolution. So if you have formed an RGB image, then you can just stack it on top of pan, like basically you can make panchromatic enhancement. There are algorithms uh, which are coded already in GDAL. So you can use them to make better images or images of better resolution. And then you can do contrast change for better visibility of your image, right? So. All of this is done. You have trained your model, et cetera. So the last step would be to derive insights out of it, right? So during data processing, your algorithm can be used to detect a lot of stuff as in forest fire, and we'll uh, see examples of how people are using this, right? And uh, you can detect flood and atmospheric hazards. Like basically, uh, I was just looking at a tweet a couple of minutes back where uh, you might said they predicted, uh, not predicted actually, they just, calculated how the um, SO2 concentration from California fires has already reached Finland. I mean, you can do all of these cool analysis on top of this data, right? And then other climate crisis like ozone hole depression, you can calculate literally everything because most of the data are openly available, right? And you can develop your own composite imagery. We'll talk about composite imagery in a bit more detail, but you can uh, generate your composite imagery like CIR or uh, NDVI. These are basically vegetation indices, they help you identify vegetation more clearly, right? And then, uh, yeah, like I said, so RGB images, they can uh, basically iterate it through your pre-trained DL algorithms, and they can help you identify a lot of cool features which are earth-based, as in, uh, say, like I told, um, roads, ne uh, road networks, and then uh, bridges, buildings, rivers, etc. Okay, so let's not talk a bit about composites, right? So you get the general idea how a satellite Im imagery data has a lot of bands and then every band can be stacked together to form some kind of meaningful insights. So various bands, yeah, they are both there in uh, Landsat and Sentinel. And this example has a blue, green and a red band which are combined together to form a CIR image. Like basically it helps you identify uh, all the vegetation better. So these are some example of composites. These bands are uh, Landsat bands. And if you combine them, you get, uh, you, you get a type of image which helps you gain some insight, right? For example, in the first case, we have CIR or color infrared. Then uh, if you stack these bands together, all the red, uh, the part which are colored in red, they, they indicate better vegetation, right? And the parts which are blue or gray, they indicate very minimal or lower vegetation index. Right? We have six, five, and Okay, I cannot see it, but it's probably three or two. Anyway, so this helps us identify the health index of an agriculture, right, of, or an agricultural land. And in here we have a geology 
composite, which helps like geologists identify uh, features on the or the topography of a place on Earth. Right? It has seven, six, and two band. If you combine them together, you get this image. And we have SWIR images. If you invent seven and oh wow, I cannot say it anyway. So yeah, basically that band name. If you combine all of those, uh, if you combine those indices or bands together, you get a SWIR image. And in it, we have uh, basically the green represents better vegetation index, right? So yeah, a lot of details are around satellite imagery and a lot of co concepts are going on. Let's let's not talk about how we can put it in some code and get some image, right? I'll demo you. I'll demo uh, an example of something which I wrote. Uh, the, so like I told you about Felicit, which helps you uh, download and process satellite images from your command line, right? So let's now talk about these. So in Felicit, there are two major files like. There is one called sat downloader.py. It searches and download downloads the satellite image. And by satellite image, I mean Landsat. I didn't have time to build one for Sentinel. I'm working on it. But this is sat downloader.py. And let's see what do we have in here. We have a function called search Landsat data, right? So to search a Landsat data, let's think about some stuff which we need, right? We need coordinates of a place, right? So for example, where you are based out of, we draw a small, very tiny rectangle about uh, one, two kilometer squares, right? So yeah, so we need that coordinates, and then we need a limit on the cloud cover, right? Like it was discussed in our previous talk um, a short while back. It was a short talk, but yeah, basically we can limit on the cloud cover, like five percent or ten percent of the whole image. We can uh, query on top of this, and I collection by collection I mean the kind of service, right? Are uh, I'm using the uh, stack service provided by uh, development seed, so I'm querying explicitly for Landsat data sets. So I search these items, I get the item, I don't search by date, which is really a flaw, clearly. But uh, yeah, so I return the first image which I get. And then after that, so I know some, like it, like we saw in the JSON, it has a list of all the bands, uh, the location to each of these band in URL format. And then we can download them. And after downloading them, uh, how do we process it? So are you imported from the raster that you? Right, so this is the library which is used to interact with raster data. So this is the path B5 is the path to the B5 band or the red band. Yeah. So um, so I open all of these bands and they are basically 2D arrays and these are some. Um, so yeah, this is to generate vegetation index. Right. So yeah, basically what I'm doing is I'm writing the NIR band, R and G band. Right. So. This helps basically if you stack them on top of each other, that's how you make an image, right? And um, yeah, after that, I do some uh, color is RIO color. This is also developed by Mapbox. They help you uh, increase the, you know, some do some image uh, enhancement to, for better visibility, like contrast changes, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, so that's how you process an image. Similarly to generate RGB images, what I do is I stack these bands together and then I, I basically write the RG and B in a single image, and then I close this file, right? Um, and then if I want to do some panchromatic enhancement, GDAL pan sharpen is already uh, it's a it's it's it comes with GDAL. The, all the Python bindings I've stored a file here called GDAL pan, pan sharpen dot py. It comes with GDAL scripts. You can download it and use it to pan sharpen the images, right? So it takes two locations: the parent path and the child path, and yeah, it pan sharpens the images for you. So that's an example of how uh, I used uh, Rastrio and RIO color and GDAL to do something uh, okay. -ish. But anyway, so let's look at some more cool things which people have done. Let's say you don't want to download a lot of images or a lot of data from Landsat and you're, you don't have that network bandwidth to do it, right? And you want to deploy an application. So the first repository is um, a cool repository which is you, which basically, fetches these images from Mapbox and patches it and it generates a required width and height, right? Basically an image with your given width and height and the coordinates, mm -hmm. right? So it generates that image for you. And then the second example is a bot which detects fire in real time, right? So this, the author has decided to close source this, but I remember when it came out. So it was like it, uh, the software or the script or the service, it sub subscribed to the Amazon SNS Right, so this is the notification service of Amazon. Every time Landsat there is a new data in Landsat registry, it there is a notification in this service. Right, so it taps on this notification and then uh, processes 
the data for fire to detect fires and it has successfully detected many fires uh, before even the local police service they joined in and I, i'm not sure if i remember the name and there is one more commercial service which also does this so this is already in place and i'm sure all of you can build one out on your own right and uh, some miscellaneous topic we should talk about right so what are some current issues with also also observation right so first of all data the data which we get are uh, really limited and closed source so i'm sure it's not very easy to publicize the data either i mean there are a lot of satellite costs and maintenance costs involved but this is one of the issues i've seen people talk about and then we should build open source product uh, products because of course there will be scientists who don't have a lot of financial resources to use close uh, to use close source software so we can try our best to build the software and release in open source licenses right and our responsibilities as citizens of earth who can code right so uh, we are kind of cool because we all know how to code and how to build cool applications so let's give a little back to earth and give a little back to the citizens or our people who are fighting for a better planet right and lastly i want to talk about a thank you note right so thanks to martin and all the Geo, geo python team who helped making the conference online and bringing us all together it's a community i really cherish because all of you are amazing and uh, personally i want to thank uh, raimar and yon from the mss team they helped me bring uh, into uh, basically yeah they got me into geo special and i'm really grateful to them and yeah if you have any questions we can have them now or you can dm me on twitter uh, or you can go to my website and get the contact and talk to me i'm open to really any conversation yeah that's all thanks thank you very much very nice talk um are there any questions yes i see there is a questions question from martush great talk i am not very familiar with remote sensing but i'm curious what is the state of public trained models for satellite imagery can somebody oh sorry uh, let me i am not able to read the question sorry, uh, could you sweep it again martin so the question is uh, he's curious what's the state of public trained models for satellite imagery right so i talked about something called robotsat it's by mapbox and uh, i think if you search awesome remote sensing on github i'm not sure i've never really got into the machine learning and deep learning side of deep learning side of remote sensing but i'm pretty sure if you search awesome remote sensing there's a repository on github which uh, discusses a lot of cool publicly available model also you should really check out uh, robots at by mapbox i'll put a link the link is already on the slides and i'll put a link to the slides on discord so please check it out then okay are there any more questions i see there are currently no questions in the chat so i i actually have a question about this robosat i never used that um so if i want to get into it what's the easiest way is are there many examples or how should i do it yeah martin so uh, this is funny so you know sangarshanan so sangarshanan and i are co-workers and sangarshanan suggested to me about robotsat i personally never used it but yeah i'm like there is an open issue i'm trying to work on it and then yeah really even i'm not sure how to use it but i i checked the repo it is pretty cool i think the model is pre trained you just have to pass images and they will calculate uh, you know just like a pretty much normal image processing model it's a, probably a cnn i've never checked it out myself disclaimer yes 